Well, I uh, must confess, oh, wow. Uh, I, I must confess to you that I misled you last week. This is the last Wednesday night study. Uh, the tomorrow, I mean, next week is the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. And I'd rather just wrap it up tonight than come back by myself next week. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> kind of share those thoughts, just kind of intimacy of my own. Um, although with my personality, that's always a crowd. So uh, shouldn't shouldn't be too bad. Uh, how many of you will be sad to be leaving this book? Uh, and all of you were so afraid of it when we started, right? It was going to give you nightmares and, and you were going to be up at night, uh, you know, worried about all of this stuff. And, and the book is not nearly the way that, that a lot of our friends have been portraying it. Pardon me? Did I miss? Oh, y'all high-fiving over here. Cool. Um, it's not nearly as frightening as it is encouraging remember this book was written so those seven churches would feel better about their circumstances not more frightened uh, the book is written to encourage people who are already in frightening circumstances already in difficult uh, situations you didn't have to make up anything like a dragon they were already going through their own nightmare so for for john to write a book that makes them feel better is an abuse of the privilege of, of, of the pulpit. He was writing a book to tell them it's going, yes, it's tough. It's going to get tougher. It gets better. So don't give up before the sun rises. Don't give up before the dawn breaks. Uh, I, most of us have, read, have uh, read or at least heard referred to that um, um, article that was written, we'll never know some of the things that were not discovered because the researcher gave up too soon. We'll never know some of the things that could have been achieved because the one going after it gave up too soon. And so John is writing to these early churches going, now listen, you've already come this far. Be sure that you hang in there and you don't miss the big party at the end because you gave up too soon. So tonight we are picking up with uh, chapter 21, and we will have uh, chapters 21 and 22 uh, before, um, uh, as, as we close tonight, and then I need to run to the new member uh, class uh, that is meeting in Wilson Hall. Uh, now, by no means did we, did we do the whole breadth and depth of this book. You can literally spend as much time and as much of your life uh, studying the book of Revelation as you want to. Uh, you can go as deep in this end of the pool as your little breath can stand uh, and, and still be, be frustrated by all that you don't. Uh, there are significant passages and, and a lot of fun passages that we just literally didn't have time to get to. I do hope a couple of things have happened in this study. One, I hope I gave you a framework, i.e., this is a book of worship written by a worship leader to worshiping communities about whom to worship. That will help you as, as you continue to study on your own. Uh, I, I do think, I do hope that I have given you an, a new appreciation for the brilliance of this book and for, uh, and for its great message of hope and to help you understand why of all the books of the New Testament, uh, this is the book that has a regular life cycle of floating back up to the top when the church finds itself in an oppressive situation. Uh, if, if you would go to... Uh, situations in, in, uh, in the world now where the church is being persecuted in certain Muslim countries and that kind of thing, you would find them spending a lot of time uh, in this book uh, because of the message of hope it has to a church uh, uh, under pressure. Now, I'll do this with some great trepidation. I won't spend a whole lot of time, but if, is there just any question that I haven't a answered or addressed that you just got to ask or die before we get out of Revelation? How many resurrections? There are um, it, 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 it depends on how you count them. Okay, there there is. Um, uh, in, in fact, I, I think it is in this verse we, we get to it. There is the resurrection where the saints, the faithful, will, will join with Christ on the earth, and that's one. And, and 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 so there's the resurrection of the believers that is different from the resurrection of the non-believers. 
Uh, everybody, uh, we have this thousand years of peace uh, that we talk about in a little bit. Then everybody is raised, and then we have the judgment. And, and, uh, and the believers are judged by their works. And Paul talks about this. You, you, will be, you, you may be saved, but you'll say, be saved like a man who barely escapes a burning house, you know, with nothing but the shirt on your back kind of attitude. And the others will be judged because of their non-belief and, and be released to follow the beast. So there are, there, there's the resurrection of the believers and the resurrection of, uh, of the non-believers. But, but in this passage, it is two separate, uh, two separate resurrections and one judgment uh, together. Now, it's a different type of judgment, but there is one judgment. Okay. There is, there is a, and her question is that, that with this resurrection of the unbelievers that happens after the millennial reign, the thousand years, that there is some indication and there are some scholars who believe that there is one more chance because what we see in Revelation and what we'll see again tonight is as, as we come to the end, as it is painfully obvious that this is where the, the, the followers of the beast end up, that there is, there's warning after warning after warning and invitation after invitation after invitation. Now, the traditional view is that um, it's appointed um, uh, man wants to live, wants to die, and then, then the judgment. But we have that little confusing passage in, uh, is it Second Peter? Uh, and the reason nobody ever knows where it is is because nobody ever preaches on it because we're scared to death of it. Where, where after, after the resurrection, Christ preached to the prisoners. And, uh, and we, we don't, uh, nobody knows what that means. The traditional assumption, and it is an assumption because this verse just kind of appears out of, out of nowhere, is that, is that, after the resurrection and before the appearance, those three days that we don't know where Jesus was, that he preached in hell. And so everybody gets a chance. Now, that, uh, again, that's the traditional understanding. Uh, we don't have, uh, because it's just, it's just an aside. And in, in Second Peter, it's in there like, uh, like everybody knows this. <laughs> uh, but... Um, the traditional assumption is that everybody has one life to live and in that life has multiple chances to respond. And if they don't, they're, they're then judged by their, their, their final response. Uh, and, and you don't get a second chance. But there are those passages that, that, would, that people on the other side of the argument have used with different levels of success about maybe there's more than one chance. We do know in Revelation that there is chance after chance after chance after chance. Uh, even, even before the... But, 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 pardon me? For, 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 for even the followers of the beast. I mean, there, there, there's all kind of things. Even before Armageddon, there, there are several invitations and several warnings for them to step away from that, that path and find, and find salvation, and they don't. Um, again, John does not... Write this linearly, okay? We, we always want it to be A happens and then B happens and then C happens. And C happens because B happened right after A. Uh, and he's not concerned with that. He, he's concerned with this explosion of images and, 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 and he, he, you, you get the sense that he's overwhelmed in what he's trying to communicate to us. And the best way he can communicate to us is for us to be overwhelmed as he is. And, and if you get this sense of after you read Revelation that you have been caught by an unexpected wave at the beach. 
Uh, like, you know, you're standing out in the water posing for a picture and one of those waves sneaks up behind you and throws you down and holds you down on the sand and you can't get up and it rolls you around and you have that, that fleeting second of, of panic that I'm going to drown here in six inches of water. That's kind of the feeling he has. I, 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 I am caught in this, in this movement of grace and power and I can't get up long enough to catch my breath. Here, here's what... Um, here, here's what we know. There is this great, great history, this great salvation story, this God story uh, that, um, that begins in Genesis or even begins before time. If, if you take some that, that, that before the foundation of the earth, Christ uh, was slain and, and has now moved in this intentional process uh, that God has been seeking to, to accomplish his work and looking for people who would be open to him. And, and he would start here, and if that, if that didn't work, then he'd find another way. But he's always finding a way to work. And he's not going to let anything frustrate his purposes, not even an enemy as, as destructive and as powerful as the dragon and the beast and all their allies. Everybody has plenty of chances to know. And if you're going to be held accountable for a decision, then you have to make that decision knowing the decision you're making and the implications of that decision. This is not an oops decision. And anyway, one of the things, and of course you, were, you, you taught in high school uh, a long time, I've dealt with students a long time, one of the great tragedies is that our young people make decisions having no understanding of the consequences of those choices. And they're devastating. This is not that. The people who are judged here and held accountable are not surprised. Uh, they know exactly what's coming, and they have made a decision in, uh, um, at, w with understanding the consequences. Uh, you know, Paul talks about uh, how the, the nation of Israel is going to be grafted back into the salvation family. And there's, you know, this, this theory and that theory and, and, and what the, the reconstitution of the democracy of Israel in 1948 uh, what kind of implications that has, and is that con uh, connected to the kingdom of Israel that we see uh, in, in, in the Old Testament, and how all that goes together. I, I, I don't know, I, and, and I can't make any sense of that. Here's what I do know. God made a promise to Abraham, and God always keeps his promises. And God will keep his promise to Abraham in such a way that Abraham will bless God for the faithfulness of keeping promises. That Abraham will not feel cheated or uh, snookered by the, by the way God keeps his promise concerning the salvation of Israel and his people. Now, what the details of that are, I don't know. Uh, I, I do know that, that John is telling those seven churches, and now these, from the seven churches he's telling us, that if you persevere and you're faithful, to keep the commandments of Jesus despite the circumstances and despite the cost, Jesus will keep his promise to you. And that if you don't want to be with him, then he won't make you. Uh, and that, that is a heartbreaking reality of, 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 of this book. Now again, let's remember, we come to the, uh, to the uh, chapters 20 and 21 after the aftermath. Uh, the world has been uh, devastated by uh, the, the rule of the beast and, and, and the, the attack of the dragon. Remember, the beast owned all the commerce, all authority, all the governments. Everything was under his rule. Nothing happened without his permission. Nothing happened without a loyalty being expressed to him. Because of that, all of creation was now suffering because of what the beast had done, because of what people had done under the rule of the beast. We see this happen all the time. Uh, greed drives us to make certain decisions because we want to maximize profits and do this. And, uh, and, and we would devastate uh, the environment. We, uh, West Virginia uh, and, 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 and how they have topped the mountains in, 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 in the strip mining of coal. Uh, there's a lot going, uh, of uh, uh, discussion now about uh, industry and the regulation of industry and industry doesn't want to be regulated and I'm, I'm old enough to remember when Lake Erie caught on fire. Do y'all remember that? Y'all remember Lake Erie catching on fire? It was so polluted and, and so many chemicals were in Lake Erie that if you dropped a match in Lake Erie, Lake Erie would burn. Uh, 
some people on both sides of the right and left have way too much confidence in human beings. Uh, that that we just get just give human beings enough time or whatever, and we'll solve all the world's problems. No, we won't. <laughs> We're the ones that created all of these problems. And as a buddy of mine tells me, all of today's problems are yesterday's solutions. Now what? The battle is over. The earth is devastated. What are we going to do now? John introduces a new heaven and a new earth. Now notice what he says about this new heaven. First, everything has passed away. The old has passed away. Behold, I'm making all things new. The old earth is gone. Now, what that looks like, I don't know. And uh, if you watch the sci-fi channel like I do, there are all kind of interesting scenarios on how the world can blow up. Um, but we, we don't know. We, we, and we, and it's, uh, it, it's not so devastating that the people who are watching it, who are aware of it, who are part of it, are frightened of it because they're more celebrating the, the appearance of the new rather than the, the, uh, than the loss of the old. And there, there are a couple of things about this new. One, there is no more sea. Why is that significant? It's a symbol of chaos. Uh, the Lord, uh, in the creation story, tells the ocean, you can come this far on the land, but no further. Uh, the, the, uh, the Israelites as a people, as a culture, were not a seafaring people. Uh, we do have some uh, stories of, a, of an Israelite navy. Most of the time, they, they, they rented that out. Uh, and it was the Phoenicians were the seagoers. The Greeks, of course, were great. But, but as, a, as, a, as a whole, uh, you don't have many stories of I I Israeli sailors. Uh, you have the story about Jonah, but that, that's not much of a sailing story. It's more of a fishing story. And, uh, but the, for them, the, the sea was a sign of chaos. And, and you once, you know, uh, you know, I have friends who won't swim in the ocean. Why? I can't see my toes. And you don't know what's going to be biting on your toes if you can't, if you can't see them. Of course, you know, my, my thing is, listen, it's, it's the guy you can see that you need to be afraid of uh, in, in the ocean. But this symbol of chaos and just being swallowed up, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the storm surge that, that Sandy brought in to the northeast and how it just utterly destroyed uh, civilization. It, it, it took power away. It took, it took food away. It took heat away. Everything that we think we need to have some kind of civilized life, the sea in a matter of hours literally wiped away. So we're not going to have any more of that. We do have water. We do have rivers. But rivers are controlled. Rivers have banks. And, uh, and in 22, we'll see a symbolic river. This is the holy city. Interesting. The creation story, the story of Genesis, begins in a garden. The final promise is a city. And that, that's interesting. How many of you think that, that heaven is more like a garden of Eden? How many, some of us have that. I'm going to go, I'm gonna, and he walks with me and talks with me, uh, and, and we sing about the garden. But the ultimate promise is not a garden. It's a city. More people now than ever in the history of the world live in cities. In cities. It is a city. We're going to be in a place that is safe, strong, works together, neighbors, all together in a city, not a garden. This, this city comes out of heaven from the abiding place of God. God has been working on this city. It's, it's as if he's had this city back in his workshop. Now the time has come and he is revealing this holy city to us. This is his city. He's the one who has built it and it is coming from him. This is not a city made with human hands. And when you begin to see some of the dimensions of it in just a minute, you'll begin to understand uh, why, why John uh, began to talk like that. We have 
a city like a bride. Now again, understand how quickly he switches these metaphors. You know, we're told in writing that you need to pick one metaphor, stay with that metaphor, don't confuse metaphors, don't use a whole bunch of metaphors because the reader can't follow. John didn't care a bit about any of that. Uh, in just a handful of verses, we have four or five very, very strong images that, that are so strong that they are now part of the common language of our culture. A lot of these phrases you will hear people use every day. Um, holy city, you'll hear, you'll hear used um, like a bride of heaven. You'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear that used. The, the idea is this is a perfect beautiful without blemish place this is also one of the pictures that paul uses in ephesians 5 about how a husband is to treat his wife without blemish holy this, this is this is one of those pictures that god has prepared this place and this was going to be the, the dwelling place, it's like the bride. And, and I'll, I'll stand about right here. The groom will be here. And those doors right there in the center aisle, you know, this was, this was a big deal when we designed this sanctuary. Uh, some of you remember it, 409 Franklin Road. What was the big problem in that sanctuary? There was no center aisle in that sanctuary. And we had two side aisles, and it just messed everybody up. So the first thing when we started talking about this, the, the sanctuary is, were we going to have a center aisle? And poor Joe Hudson was in a lot of meetings about what the center aisle was going to do and how it was going to look like. That hallway space and women's bathrooms were the big controversies that we had in, um, uh, in, in, in coming over here. But, but there is something about that moment um, for, the, for the groom. When those doors open and he sees his bride for the first time that day is a moment that he will never remember, uh, that he will never forget. That he'll always remember it. And mo most, of the mo most of the groomsmen are kind of brain dead anyway by that time. So they just, just tell me what to say, Mike, because I can't remember anything. Almost without exception, if you tell a guy to think about his wedding day, that's the picture that comes to his mind first. He doesn't think, I got up at 7 o'clock and shaved and, and, and that, no. He'll think about the time that those doors opened and he saw his wife for the very first time. It is that kind of universal experience and it's that kind of moment that John is talking about. Christ has prepared the bride, the body, and this is the work of Christ, the body of Christ. The bride is now ready for this relationship. Now, look at the celebration in verse 3. I heard a loud voice from heaven from the throne. This is God celebrating that the promise of Emmanuel has now come true. A virgin will have a child. We'll name that child Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is, this is the Christmas promise that we pick up on now. This promise is true. The dwelling place of God is with humanity. I will be their God and they will be my people. It's as if God is saying, this is what I've always wanted. Uh, I don't know about your dad, but my dad would have had all of us living in the same house. Now, some of you hear that, that we'd all be on the same property, that dad would have his house and Mitch would have a, a house and his family would live on one side of dad's house and I would have another house with me and my family and my boys and their family. No, my dad would have us all in the same house. And we would have different rooms in that house, but we would all be in the same house. That's what my dad always wanted. And my dad was always the happiest when everybody was, was there. Uh, all of our uncles and aunts, all of our grandparents, all of our cousins, uh, people we weren't even related to but we were good friends or for a long time, they were over there. My dad loved the crowd and the big party. This is the moment that God is now celebrating. This is what I've always wanted. All of my children are here. And nothing is going to take us apart anymore. The fullness of God pushes everything out. We don't have to let the gates down. We don't have to let the gates down. Okay, at night you had to be afraid of warriors and uh, uh, bandits and surprise attacks. So you would, you would shut the city up. You would lock the gates. 
The presence of God and the glory of God is so strong that he pushes the light through those gates and nothing is strong enough to push the light back in the gates and come in. Does that make sense? The presence of God is so full of this city. Uh, the bride shines like jasper. Where else do we hear jasper? In the worship celebrations of chapter 4 and 5, I saw a light on the throne shining like jasper. The walls were made of jasper. See? See, see what John's saying? This whole city is filled with the essence of God. The bride is full of the essence of God. So much so, so pure in this light that everything that is not God is simply flushed out, pushed away, and can't push its way back in. Now that is an important picture of discipleship. Okay? That the Christ follower fills his life, her life, so completely with the person of Christ that everything that is not Christ is pushed out. Everything is new. I'm not going to let anything frustrate me from from, from finishing what I want. Now, at, at, at the end of this paragraph, we have the promise again where the victor inherits. To the victor, I will give water. Uh, uh, from, I will give the living water. But if you are an unbeliever, and there's this long list, and we got this one little thing of, uh, to the victor will inherit these things, I will be his God, and he will be my son. But, now look how intensely he lists these, these sinners. But the cowards, the unbelievers, vile murderers, sexual immor- uh, 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 the sexual immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all the liars, there will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, if you're ever wondering where John was a Southern Baptist, this proves it. He was. Because flat, he is flat holding some people over hell like a marshmallow, isn't he? He almost seems to enjoy this. To the victors, God will be with him and he, and he will be with God. But to these lying, cheating, no count... That, They're going to burn in hell. Understand what's happened. What is the circumstance of this letter's writing? Persecution. It doesn't mean that these were people having multiple illicit affairs. It means they were people who were selling out and worshiping the idols. They were people who were caving when somebody put a sword to their heart and said, say, G- say Caesar is Lord and we'll let you go. But if you say Jesus is Lord, we're going to kill you. And they would say Caesar is Lord and escape. And John is saying to these people, if you make the choice not to be identified with Christ when the pressure is on. You won't find a place to be identified with him when we all come home. Now, he's writing to uh, a church or a group of churches that is enduring some very, very tough pressure. I don't know about you, but when I read this passage, I started kind of thinking about all the times that I have sold out all the times that I have been less than brave and it is not nearly under this kind of pressure, is it? My life was never threatened. Uh, Maybe my place in the group was threatened. But my life was never threatened. So I'm wondering What would happen to church attendance if it got serious in North America? I wonder what happens to our giving when it is no longer tax deductible. Will you tithe anyway?
this will happen in my lifetime. I'm not saying it's going to happen in the next handful of years, but it will happen in my lifetime. And there's going to be two things that drive it. One, the federal government needs money. So it's going to... I'm, I, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. I'm just saying that that's, where, that's one of the things that they're going to cut all of uh, the deductions. That's already on the board. It's already happening with certain people over certain incomes. They don't get the tax deduction for charitable giving. What's going to be the other thing that drives it? Pardon me? Gay agenda. If, if we preach that it's not God's will to live as a homosexual, gay, lesbian couple, that will be considered hate speech. The church will lose, the churches that preach that will lose their tax deduction for propagating hate speech and will be considered a hate group. Uh, I don't know if you were uh, paying attention to some of the debates but a couple of uh, the candidates were, were chastised for giving money to a hate group. Do you know what hate group they were talking about? The Family Research Council, which supports the traditional view of marriage on Capitol Hill. And because they, have a, uh, they, they don't support gay marriage, then they are classified by some as a hate group. Uh, that's coming, folks. Just as sure as I'm looking at it. I mean, I, I don't even have to be that strong of a prophet to say that because it's already happening in Europe. Pastors are being thrown in jail uh, for preaching hate speech. And it's, and it's when they attack the gay lifestyle, they're thrown in jail. That's happening. Um, so understand, John is not playing here. This has really happened. He's had friends who were killed because somebody sold them out. He said church members who were put in prison because somebody ratted them out and wouldn't support them. So this is, this is not something done lightly. And, and, and honestly, we, we should... We should um, We, we should think very seriously about how casually we, we identify ourselves as Christ followers and how, uh, how comfortable we are with that designation and not realizing the full weight of the, of, of the choice that is involved in it or the cost uh, that may be... Uh, may be required of us. Now, again, here we go with the mixed metaphors. And we're introduced again to the new Jerusalem, the bride, and, and we have all of this great des description. We have another description about the city itself, and it goes on and on and on. In my view, we have two things going on here. We don't have so much mixed metaphors as John giving you a lot of images real fast. One of the images, this first image, is about the people of God and how God has prepared us now for this time of relationship. We talk about salvation in three, three parts. One is justification, the initial part of accepting Christ as Savior and being justified, lined up with Christ. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. The second part is sanctification, that daily part of following Christ where we become more like Him and we are made more and more into his image. We are sanctified, made holy as he is holy. And then the last one is glorified. The last one is in this moment when his work in us is complete and we're welcomed into his presence. The description of this holy city, the bride, the, the wife of the lamb, is the description of the church glorified, ready now for this relationship without end, with, with, uh, with our Savior and our God. And what a city it is. It is 1,200 stadia wide, 
1,200 stadia long and 1,200 stadia high. Roughly, it's about a 1,500-mile cube. Now, for those of you who, who want to think this is literal, then, then you, you got a problem with a 1,500-mile-high city. Uh, we have some big buildings, but we don't have anything that stands 1,500 miles high. This city is made of jasper. The walls are made of jasper. Again, it goes back to that first uh, uh, appearance of God on the throne, and I believe it's chapter 4, where, where he is shining like crystal, like jasper. It's a, it's a, it's a clear, uh, almost diamond-like material. And the city is made out of this uh, to, to, to reflect that everything now is the essence. We have these symbolic dimensions. We have 12 gates that are named from the 12 tribes of Israel. Every tribe of Israel has a gate to come home in. 12 foundations named after the apostles. And each apostle has a certain uh, semi-precious stone that, that symbolizes his presence. Paul talks about building on the foundation of the apostles. Uh, the, 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 those first uh, men and women who preached the gospel after Pentecost uh, are, are the foundation that we believe has come down to us uh, of the gospel story that has come down to us that we now proclaim that Jesus is indeed the, the Son of God. All of these are telling us something about the city. They are not literal by any means. They are very, very symbolic. The first thing, and I mentioned this Sunday morning, is you have a cube. Uh, now, if you are paying attention to your Bible, you will recognize that the Holy of Holies is the other cube that is mentioned in the Old Testament. The place where God symbolically lived among his people, where the high priest could only go once a year, now we are invited to live in that holy of holies. Uh, these stones that are listed, the jasper, the sapphire, the chalcedonia, the emerald, and the sardonyx, uh, scholars uh, mention that some of these stones are on the breastplate of uh, the ephod. Uh, they're in no particular order. Uh, most of the time when the stones of the ephod are listed in the Old Testament, they're always listed pretty much in the same order. Uh, each tribe of Israel having a stone that represented them. Uh, the names of each tribe written on each stone backwards so that the names of the sons of Israel are always before the Lord uh, when, when the high priest stood in the presence of God. Uh, if, if there's not a one-to-one -one matchup, uh, there is a, at least a symbolic reference, a quick stroke of the pen or, or stroke of the brush where, where John at least wants you to have this in your mind that, that uh, there is this, this, this beautiful place of worship, this holy place of worship where everybody has a place, where everybody's story is remembered and everybody is welcome and everybody has access here. This city is big enough for everybody that, that wants to get in there. So don't press these things too hard. Uh, you know, you'll read books where uh, a cubit, the biblical cubit is, is uh, the length from a man's elbow to the tip of his finger. That's a biblical measure of ref, uh, uh, measurement. Now, what's the obvious problem with that? Everybody's got a different length. Okay, so you, you don't have an exact, it's not going to be one-to-one, -one. okay? Uh, I have one, Wilt Chamberlain would have another one. Shaq would have another one, okay? But that's the cubit from elbow to here. Traditionally, it's about 18 inches. But you can see what happens when you start trying to press these things literally. John had no concern that you do that. Okay, he wasn't wanting you to go get a ruler 18 inches long and go out in the parking lot and try to reconstruct these dimensions any more than Noah wants you to go out and build the ark uh, out here with the dimensions that he's given. Okay, we're not given the measurements for that purpose. The purpose here is this. If you want to be at home with Christ, there's room for you. This is another way of John 14. I go away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, 
There are many rooms, many mansions. There's a place for you, and I'm going to prepare that place. This is that place, and there's enough room for everybody. When this, when this was read in those seven churches, the seven churches would be going, it'd be like a kid at Disneyland, you know? Wow! That's what he wants. He doesn't, he doesn't want some engineer putting out his, his, his you know, slide rule going, well, let's see, that's about 1,500 miles high, and I don't know how you would structure a city to stand 1,500. Okay? He's not left-brained. He's right-brained. So don't push these things too hard. They're just, they're, the part of it is to just overwhelm you. And this is good news for some of you. There's no church. You don't have to go to church. Bad news is you're in church all the time. This thing that we try to recreate, this, this relationship and the symbol of the relationship, the, the, the bread and the cup are a symbol of the relationship. Uh, the scripture is the story of the relationship. All of these things we have, the music and, uh, and, and the order of the service and all of that is a way we try to recreate the relationship, to remind us of the significance of this relationship. Then, as Paul reminds us, now we'll see through the glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. And we'll know even as we are known. So the symbols of God's presence, the symbols of God's presence are no longer needed. Why? We have the real thing. Uh, part of the reason we have steeples is a symbolic reminder to people that God is in this place that God is in the middle of his people. God himself will be there, and we won't need it. We won't, we won't have a sun and moon. Now, here's the controversy here, and here's what people will spend a lot of time arguing about, believe it or not. Is, does John say there is no sun or moon, as in, in the new earth they're not part of it, or is the glory of God so brilliant that you can't see the sun and can't see the moon as if the moon is out during the day but it's not bright enough for you to see and there are pages and pages and pages and pages of theologians arguing about this. Uh, does it make any difference if it's there or not there if you can't see it? Probably to some of you it does. And this will be what you will check when we get to this place. We'll all be in worship and I'll see some of you going, is it here or not? <laughs> the, the traditional sources of light the traditional sources of comfort, of life, of hope, are all replaced by the real thing. His face was shining as bright as the sun. We won't have to use those metaphors anymore. We won't have need of this. All the kings the earth will bring their glory into it. Kings will bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord. That all of the, that there won't be anybody competing for the glory of God. There won't be anybody trying to snatch that away from him. The enemy has been defeated. All the glory in the universe will now, uh, as if it's been dispersed in the universe. Well, now, you know, in, in, in this uh, mystery of, of, of magnetism, as, as it were, be brought back into God, and God will reveal himself in all of his fullness. There will not be any evil there, nothing to fear. The glory of God will, will push all of that out. And it's not so much that we have just gone from place to place and, 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 and thrown the evil out as it is the presence of God pushing everything that is not him away. Chapter 22. It's as if John can't complete the, 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 um, uh, the description of the city. And it, fills, and it spills over into uh, uh, chapter 22. He said, oh, 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 oh there, there's a couple more things I want to tell you about this city. <laughs> uh, there's a river in it. 
Okay, and this river flows from the throne of God. This is the river of life. Now, where else have we heard springs of life, rivers of life, where there's... If you knew who you were talking to, you would ask of me, and I would give to you springs of water that never run dry. To a desert culture, water was, was life. That's why the cities are always near water, close to water, around water. That's why they're always around the rivers. Uh, that's why Nashville was founded where it was, because it was in the bend of the Cumberland River. Uh, this, this river flows, uh, which is the, the, another symbol for the Spirit of God, flows from the very th uh, throne of God, giving life to all that. It is surrounded by the tree of life. There is this image of what was lost. And the curse is now being restored to us. The curse is no more. This tree of life that caused so much uh, angst in the first chapters of Genesis now stands in the center. It's like the, it's like the righteous man that we're described in Psalm 1 who blooms in season and out of season. And these leaves are there for the healing of the nations. The curse is now over. What, what we lost in Genesis 3 is now given back. All of it. The relationship with God, relationship with each other, relationship with ourselves, relationship with nature, relationship with work, all of that is restored. And now the kingdom is complete. And so the church responds by the only way it can. Christ promises to come quickly. This is a hard moment, isn't it? It's that moment at the end of a great show when the words come up to be continued. Why? We're there. Well, no, not quite yet. Everything is being finished, but there's still a little ways to go. Jesus is coming, and he is coming quickly, but not yet. Okay? The promise is given. The promise is sure. You can count on the promise. So if you're in those seven churches in Asia Minor, you know we're not finished yet. If you're in the church in postmodern America, you know it is not promised yet. This is a funny story. <laughs> right in the middle of this, of this story about, uh, about all this great city, about this, this holy place, God being with his people, an angel comes up to John, and John is so overwhelmed, he falls down again and, and, and worships the angel. It, you almost get the feeling that John is, he, he's, he's worshiping everything and every, just, he's just so overwhelmed and an angel, boom, I'm falling down just in case. And the angel says, get up, get up. I'm just like you. I'm a servant. Don't worship the servant. Don't worship the created. Again, that little final funny story to remind you of what he's been telling you from the very beginning. Don't worship the created. Worship the Creator. Okay, it's a book of worship, two worshiping people about whom to worship. Then we go through this long series of, of, um, of warnings. Leave the book unsealed so people can read it. But don't change a word of it. If you mess with this book, change this book, and then all the plagues uh, will come to you. There is one final warning. You'll go to the lake of fire. You'll spend, if you follow the beast, you will end up where the beast takes you. There is one final invitation. Come quickly. Come, and I will give you water to drink. It's almost a direct quote, certainly a reference to the invitation in Isaiah. Why do you uh, work for food that doesn't satisfy? And so the church responds the only way the church can. Please come quickly. Please come quickly. And the spirit and the bride say, amen, so be it. Let it be so. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. All right, and I got a handful of minutes to land this plane. The book ends with... Grace to you. And that ends our uh, tour of this fabulous book. Okay, that ends us with this question. 
We have spent some time with these 22 chapters of the book of Revelation. Now what? So what? What does this mean to us? What does this message to the seven churches in the Asia Minor uh, under the, uh, the oppressive heel of the Roman Empire, what in the world is that saying to the postmodern church in North America? It is about worship. It is a book of worship written to worshiping communities by a man who led worship to answer the ultimate question about whom to worship. Now, uh, there was some real pressure on, on John's churches to worship idols and false gods. You're going, well, I'm glad we don't have that pressure. Uh, some of us may have a Buddha in our house, but it's a pencil sharpener. So, you know, we're not really worried about it. <laughs> so, um, but, but our pressure is a little more subtle. Okay? Um, no one will come up and say, I'm a false god, fall down and worship me. They will say things like, trust me, I'll take care of you no matter what. And one of the big things that happened out of this great recession is that some of us were told by corporations, trust us, we'll take care of you no matter what. And then the no matter what happened and the corporation didn't take care of us. Okay. Here's the question. To whom or to what do you look for for blessing? Here's what I mean by blessing. Who is it that you look to approve your life, to validate your life? To what do you point to to say, my life is worth something? That's the blessing. This is where our world gets us. Because our world tells us you have to have a lot of stuff around you to be validated. Okay? I was told at Kairos that I was wearing the wrong kind of jeans. I told him, I said, y'all need to get out of the waiting pool of life, get over in the deep end where things matter. And for your information, I was wearing jeans when jeans, wearing jeans meant something, right? When you were sticking it to the man, if you showed up with jeans. <laughs> now, I remember when that was protein. Come on now, we, y'all remember that, right? Show up in the, and skinny jeans. Uh-uh. No. What is wrong with you guys? That's just... Okay, now now I now make some make, make fun of my twenty something friends, and uh, and, and because one they're, they're an easy target, but uh, you know you, you got to have this or that or you're not cool. You got to do this or that, or or you're not cool. Have you been here? Have you seen that? Do you have this or you're not cool? That's worship. What is it? Who is it? It tells you not, whether or not you're cool. And you're thinking, oh, I wouldn't ever worship a false god. Well, no, probably if we brought a statue in here, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, fool for, you wouldn't fall for that one. <laughs> but answer me this. Why is it when we're planning a worship service that the first thing we have to do is find out what the football schedules are? Oh, got a little close there, didn't I? I'm sorry. Just pick your team. It could be Alabama. It could be Tennessee. It could be the Titans. It could be any number of people. But the very idea that the children of the living God, the resurrected Christ, the feeder of death, have to accommodate to cultural entertainment. Don't tell me we're not trapped by false gods. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. The main character of the book of Revelation is Jesus, okay? This is the answer to the children's sermon. You've all heard that story where the little boy was sitting down there and the pastor said, can you tell me what's brown and furry and lives in a tree? And the little boy turned to his friend and said, sounds like a squirrel, but you better say Jesus, okay? The answer to any question in the book of Je in Revelation is it's about Jesus. It's not about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is not the main player of history. It's not about who 666 is. We have all kinds of people who are auditioning for that role. It's about Jesus. It doesn't matter who 666 is. And we, and we want to play all these word games and all these number games and this Revelation bingo. And, and can't, you know, 
call, call out the right number and we'll win a little prize as if on, on the great judgment day, Jesus is going to stand up and say, I'm proud to announce we have a couple of people who guessed who 666 was. I want them to come to the front of the line so we can recognize them. And I can give them a little gold star. That's not it. John wants you thinking about who Jesus is. That's who he describes. Over and over, anytime introduced, Jesus is introduced. There's a paragraph of description. You can tell by that who Jesus, who, who, who um, John thinks the most important character is. It's about hard times. Yes, times are hard. Guess what? They're going to get worse. Um, one of my favorite passages is when Jeremiah is telling God how hard it is to be a prophet. And God answers the prophet Jeremiah by saying, You know, son, you have done well in the day of the footman. You have done well in the day of the infantry. But I'm about to release the cavalry. What in the world are you going to do in the day of the horseman? How will you stand in the day of the horseman and when the Jordan is flooding? What are you going to do, Jeremiah, when it really gets hard? Understand, yes, these are hard times. Yes, these are difficult times. Yes, these are times that are against the, the gospel we preach. Guess what? It's going to get harder. It's about perseverance. Are you tough enough to stay in there? Do you believe enough not to give up when all the circumstances around you tell you that it's not going to work? It's about battles and dragons. We really do live in a land of dragons. And, and, you know, when you read Revelation 12, all of us know who that dragon is for us. We know who it is that is stalking us. We know who it is that we're afraid of. And when, um, when you go to, you go to pe uh, uh, people who deal with people who are in great stress and you tell them to draw out what they're going through, cancer patients will draw their cancer as a dragon. Addicts will draw their addiction as a dragon. The symbol is almost universal. It's about final victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. So does the victory. And it's about final rest. And this word rest is more than just sleeping late on Saturday. It's about being finished, complete, whole, mature, done. Uh, it, it's, 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 that, um, it's that moment uh, when my mom will open the oven and she'll look at a loaf of bread or if it's early in the morning, she'll look at a pan of biscuits. Or she, kick, she cooks hers in a black iron skillet. She'll look at those biscuits and she will look at them and she will say, not yet, not quite, one more second. I, they look the same to me. And she'll open the oven and she'll say, now, and she'll grab them. These biscuits are done. This bread is done. Finished. That's what it's about. Rest finished. God looks at you, his bride, and says, just like I wanted you. Just perfect. I'm here with you. You're here with me. And this is all I have ever wanted. Home with the father, with all his children. That is our hope. And with John and all those churches in Asia, we shout back, come Lord Jesus, uh, come quickly. Let's pray together. We have talked about 666 and dragons and beasts and blood that runs as deep as the bridles of horses. We've talked about darkness and pain and suffering and some of our brothers and sisters who don't make it. 
But now we have reached the end of this great story where you welcome all of your children home, a pure and spotless bride for the great wedding feast of the Lamb. And the only thing we can say is what John said, what all of the believers across time have said. Come quickly. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you all for being part of this adventure. Thank you for joining us in Franklin. And we'll see you next year when we do the Sermon on the Mount.